Welcome to All Over the Map. Take chances and ask questions. Open discussion on all topics. The driving force. Get her done. Laughter is medicine for the soul. It's a small world after all. Big hard shot and they will they score a round trip. A shrimp very creative. There he goes. He's got the scoop. Drops it and finishes it off. Robbie Shrimp. Dipsy Doodle. Look at all. Listen, he scores. Oh my goodness. That's the move of the week. Rob was one of the key components that won the Memorial Cup with the famous London Knights team in 2005 that held the likes of players such as David Boland and Corey Perry. Robbie Schrempf was drafted in the first round, 25th overall by the Edmonton Oilers of the NHL. While playing in the National Hockey League, Rob played for the Edmonton Oilers, the New York Islanders and Atlanta Thrashers before moving his career overseas where he had mad success. Just to list off a few of his many awards and accolades. In 2002, he won the Jack Ferguson Award. In 2003, he also was on the All-Rookie Team. In 2004, he played in the CHL Top Prospects game. In 2005, he won the Memorial Cup with the London Knights. In 2006, he won the Eddie Powers Memorial Trophy. In the 2005-06 season with the London Knights, Rob scored a whopping 57 goals in 57 games with 145 points to boot, leading to the OHL in scoring. Also in 2006, he played on the CHL first All-Star team. While playing in the American Hockey League, he played in two All-Star games in 2008 and 2016 respectively. Life after hockey has been an adventure for Robbie Schrempf. He is now a businessman, entrepreneur, with a mind that is magnetized by positivity and focused thought. But Rob is a family man first, that puts his family number one before anything in this life. Robbie. What's up, buddy? How you doing, brother? How are you? Pretty good, thanks. Just been uh, running around and uh, getting a few things figured out. And yeah, pretty much, uh, I mean, we can get right into it if you want. Beauty. Yeah. Um, so what is it, like 10, 10, a, uh, 10, a, 10 p.m. there? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we might as well... Uh, fire off with the first question here. So uh, I think it's really important to, uh, for the listeners to uh, get your perspective on like, what's the first thing you think of before wrestling an alligator? <laughs> Don't get bit. <laughs> Don't get bit. Good answer. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I wanted to know the, the first thing that you thought when NHL.com uh, called you the jumbo shrimp. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I got that when I was like 14 on the USA magazine that they came out with that. So I heard that before and I've been chirped a lot because of it. So <laughs> it wasn't too shocking. Yeah. Like, did they make you any special shirts with a shrimp on it or anything like that? Was that like a special thing? <laughs> I didn't want oh, it to be a thing. That's for sure. Well, uh, apparently it was, but it's not anymore. Yeah. So uh, anyways, but uh, in all seriousness, let's get down to, I think it's really important to give the listeners uh, your perspective on, you know, what it was like uh, where you grew up and all the hard work and adversity uh, that it took to reach your dream. And, uh, you know, obviously that was playing in the National Hockey League and all the people that helped you along the way with your journey. Yeah, it was definitely, a, you know, a long, hard uh, grinding, grinding journey to get to that, that, that end destination. But it was, it was something that was, uh, you know, always had passion for. So it was something, um, you know, it was always, it was, it was fun along the way. It was challenging along the way. Um, you know, my family was so supportive to the whole thing and, and, um, a lot of people were supportive all the way through it, but the big, you know, big thing that also helped me chase my dream was a guy, a local guy that done the same thing, Tim Conley, uh, kind of right before me, kind of blazed the trail and made it a lot more realistic in my eyes to do yeah. it. Uh, I wasn't, uh, coming from where I did, you know, Fulton, New York, small town. So, um, that, that would have been, it was a bit of a pipe dream in the beginning. Um, but then again, having it be, someone else doing it right before me and um, helped me kind of stay focused and realize that it, it was, it was possible. There was a lot of people along the yeah. way that did, you know, 
kind of give you that like you think you're gonna make it like you're crazy kind of speech uh down yeah the believe the believers and the non-believers right yeah that was that was always fuel for my for me for my engine uh yeah you think i always was kind of driven to prove people wrong and uh yeah that just helped that really did help along the way as much uh you know sometimes negativity can be uh for some people, sometimes even certain instances for myself, it does weigh you down. But a lot of when I was younger, first starting these steps towards making it to the NHL, it was that that negativity was fuel for me. It pissed me off. Yeah. And it made it made me <laughs> want to, you know, prove them wrong. Yeah, it's kind of transmuting that, uh, you know, the negativity and uh, propelling that, you know, you that you forward and, uh, you know, realizing that dream must have been awesome. So. Um, yeah, I want to ask you a, a question, like how nervous were you before, uh, your first NHL game and, uh, about all the humanism that is behind, uh, pro- professional sports? Uh, yeah, first game was, it was definitely nerve wracking. Uh, uh, first NHL game was like very late in the season call up. So it was somewhere where, you know, I hadn't been around that, that team, so to speak. And, uh, you know, that first game playing at that level um it was very it was nerve-wracking and un- uncomfortable really um uh, yeah that's, that's the emotion i can if i think back to it, it was really uncomfortable and just trying to get my head in the space to go out and play and see what you know see what was going to happen it was literally like the 81st or 80th game of the season in nhl when i got called up so it was really deep in the season um oh yeah so it was uh it was yeah it was weird but uh Nothing, nothing goes as planned as I've learned in this, in this journey. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I guess they say, you know, if you're, uh, they say, if your goal doesn't scare you, then it's not big enough. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Did you ever puke during a game? No, I never had that issue. Uh, <laughs> I never got that nervous or, or, or that, uh, so I knew I played with a couple of guys that, that pulled the trigger as far as, uh, puking on themselves every game, but go in the bathroom and, and let it rip and, it was a, uh, it was a bizarre, uh, yeah, ritual, so to speak. But hey, whatever, whatever. Purging, purging before a game. Yeah. yeah. So, so, um, yeah, I heard a rumor actually that uh, you know, hockey. If hockey wasn't your chosen calling, that uh, you uh, had aspirations maybe to be a pig farmer. That's right. I love, we used to have, uh, my parents had, we had uh, pigs that we kept out on a friend's farm and we used to go out there all the time, screw around the mud, feed the pigs. And I loved it. My pig boots really enjoyed that. So <laughs> that's as far back yeah. as I go. I had these transformer boots, my pig boots. I was obsessed with them, dude. So big fan. Yeah, yeah dude. And that's what I love about you is your humility, man. It's like, you know, if one thing doesn't work, you just, uh, you know, you keep moving forward and you uh, get creative and, you know, coming from such a creative guy uh, with a, a mind that I think is, you know, absolutely on a higher plane of existence. I really think that and appreciate our friendship, too, at the same time. It's, uh, you know, it's it uh, screams integrity. And, um, you know, that's something that I'm, I'm really proud of you for. Appreciate that. Um, yeah. So uh, what was the most heartbreaking game that you ever lost? And how did you recover after that loss? Um. I would probably say, or is there just too many to name? <laughs> yeah, some big games. Game seven in the Western Conference Finals against Guelph in junior was a really that was a that was a breaker, uh, and that was actually fuel for the fire for the next season in London, where we went on to break a lot of records and have an amazing season, win a Memorial Cup. Uh, we lost that game seven to Guelph at home, and it was it was crazy. It was shocking, you know, almost disappointing all that stuff I mean, your draft year so was, you know kind of wanted to put up a championship season going into my draft uh, a lot of the reasons why it was disappointing you know um but it was it was fuel again the next year I, I know I took it personal and a lot of other guys in that team that, that came back the next year took it personal and we came out the next year with with uh you know, not only just being pissed off but also uh having learned the burning desire learned our lesson too of it doesn't just happen just because you're a really good team you got really good names on the paper it doesn't just happen so it's uh it taught us a lesson about 
closing, you know, closing the deal. Yeah, absolutely. A lot like life, eh? You're only as good as your last shift. That's right. <laughs> um, yeah, I know our audience uh, would love to hear from a champion like yourself um, on what it takes to have a winner's mindset. Yeah, I think it's a short, short memory and understanding, uh, you know, being prepared as far as the details, small details add up, right? And it's cliche if you want to, you know, everyone says it, but it's so true. The small details really add up to the big picture. Um, and it's not Absolutely. always hitting home runs out of the park. It's, you know, if we talk about hockey terms, it's it's literally the small things of getting the puck out of the zone. If you're a winger, the smallest battles, and they wind up adding up at the end. Um, you know, and, and having small details prepared and, and I don't know being prepared, but practicing on them, that's the preparation part, understanding the small details, practicing the small details, perfecting them, and then executing when it comes time, when the big dance comes, um, not being afraid to execute because you are prepared. Yeah. Moving through the fear into the un- uncomfortability that, uh, kind of gets you comfortable, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, let's talk about uh, draft day. How did, uh, how did it feel on your draft day in 2004 when you were drafted 25th overall by the Edmonton Oilers? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you were actually rated much higher. Yeah, I was, uh, I was ranked top 10 in the NHL draft, and it just had yeah. – it was just a controversial draft season. You know, I got demanded a trade out of Mississauga, and uh, actually in those playoffs got – got benched so there was a lot of a lot of negativity going into it it was uh it was a really tough time tough year um a lot of stuff i mean i mean that was hell of a draft class i mean uh sydney crosby went first overall no no right. i was the year before with ovechkin uh okay. ovechkin, Mal- well, he's not a bad player yeah <laughs> yeah no yeah he was good he can score a goal or two he was sick just like just like you okay <laughs> um Best player of all time in your mind? Of all time? Of all time. Bobby Orr, Lemieux, Gretzky, Iserman. Um, who is your, who do you think? From your standpoint, who's the best player of our time, all time? I'd, say, I'd have to say, that's such a tough question. <laughs> it really so is. many, eh? Um, from my from my memory of being watching the game, you know, you can always go to everyone else's answer. Right, you got to see Bob. I didn't get to see Bobby Orr, so I can't speak. You know, it's, I'd have to be regurgitated. From my eyes, when I watch the game, um, it's hard not to say Sidney Crosby in this era, watching how good he is and getting to see the '90s era. Um, yeah. Jeez, man, that's I'm trying to go through my mind and really pick it apart. But I I love Joe Sackick and Peter yeah. Forsberg. This top, Joe Sackick was such a good player. But if we're thinking about like today, and I seen today's game and I saw the '90s game, so Sidney Crosby is such a good hockey player. I get to play against him too, so like factors in. Obviously, he's so good at hockey, like so good at hockey. Uh, and it's a different game today, and the goalies are much bigger, players are much faster, stronger, and he's still so good at it. So, yeah, in my mind, in the way he skates and the way he plays a game, sees a game, I, I, it's hard not to, for me to pick. Because, again, I didn't really get to grow up watching Lemieux. I got when he came back in the 90s. Yeah, but I mean, he's battling his big years were kind of like late 80s, early 90s. I was five years old. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think he only had he only had 199 points in like uh, I think it was 72 games. He's on track to beat Greg Gretzky's record of 215 that year. And I remember I had a paper route and uh, my paper route was always late because I was checking the stats. <laughs> Lemieux was my favorite player at the time. And I was always seven point night, seven point night, five point night. And, and through that whole time, he's battling, you know, back, uh, back issues and having people to tie up his skates. And, you know, I met Mario in person. Uh, you know, he was my idol growing up, Gretzky and Lemieux. And uh, I mean, what a humble guy. He was doing a lot of work for fair play at the time. And, you know, when he walked into the room, it was just, you know, you could feel his aura, his, uh, his confidence. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, even a better person than hockey player, you know, and, and rebuilding that franchise too, you know, uh, it's, you know, not only has he won two championships as a player, but, you know, three championships as an owner is, uh, is pretty commendable. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's unbelievable. So who was your favorite coach 
of all time, my friend. <laughs> um, I know you've had a few. Yeah, that's tough. It's tough to pick. Uh, I would, I would have to, you know, Steve Ludwig had a big impact on me and was really, it's hard to say. Steve comes to mind right away. Ludzi was amazing, did a lot for me, taught me a lot. It's hard to pick between him and Don Kernan because Don Kernan was the guy that if I, you know, I didn't meet him, I would have never met Steve. Um, so it's between those two, Don Kernan really helping him and his son, Donnie Kernan Jr., really gave me a lot of information about hockey and taught me a ton and gave me a huge opportunity with the rink in my hometown to, to be on the ice as much as I wanted and be a rink rat. And, uh, you know, that was, the, that was the big opportunity for me. So it's, it's really tough. But Steve was, uh, Ludzi was amazing. Taught me a lot. I thought a lot of him, I looked up to him a ton. Uh, he was like a second dad to me. And I was, wish awesome. we would have had more time together. Really. He, he, I, the first year I played for him was awesome. And then they sold the team, changed management, changed everything. And that's when I, you know, it didn't fit well for for us with the new management so we demanded a trade out of mississauga and, and love these if, i mean i i just sometimes i do wonder about that if if that didn't happen if we would have had you know two or three yeah you know, even four seasons with ludzi what would have been a different outcome i think it's funny eh how everything just uh how, i guess everything happens for a reason and leads us to uh, where we are now and uh yeah i mean ho- hockey obviously hockey is a very high impact game uh, what's your opinion on cheap shots and dirty plays coming from such a skilled hockey player such as yourself? I always was given the comfort of a tough guy, to be honest with you, because I played uh, tier two junior at 14 years old. I was playing against 20 year olds and, and there were some goons and there were some, you know, shitheads and guys that would <laughs> definitely look to, t- I mean, there was times I was coming down on, let's even know what happened before I come down on one-on-one and the D instead of like trying to poke check the puck, just tomahawk and broke his stick over me. And I, I'm not crying about it. I, I kind of thrived on it again, used the negativity for that. But once that happened, we realized I needed someone to protect and that protection gave me freedom to be the player that I could be. I mean, in the 14, yeah. I wound up being on the top, I think it was top five in scoring. And then the next year at 15, I was the lead scorer in the league, but I had that freedom because of that. I didn't have to worry about getting beat up or it wasn't about getting beat up. It was more about getting hurt. Like a baseball swing over the arm, <laughs> break, break bones. Like, you know, it's not, there's another thing to stand into. If you pick and get into a fight, drop the gloves, like that's a square off, but it's a different story with cheap shots, like guys going at your knees and stuff like that. That's, that's like, it's no part of the game at all. And, uh, so that gave me, you know, Brian Basner was my really tough guy in junior. And, and then when I played Mississauga, West Ripon, then in London, there's Brandon Frost, Danny Bois, Kelly Thompson. So there was always that, uh, what's the right word, but the, these guys were like sheriffs, so to speak, you know, as soon as the cheap shot artist or the bat, you know, the bad guys would start riling up a little bit. You had these guys answer the bell and it settled everything down. Yeah, a lot of that has dissipated from the game now, wouldn't you think? Oh, uh, yeah, you know, definitely. It's, uh, it's definitely. such a skilled game now. I mean, it's so fast out there. It's unbelievable. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to uh, actually, uh, I wanted your perspective on, um, you know, we talked a little bit before on the phone, you know, about a week and a half ago, about women's hockey and how it's making, a, you know, a real resurgence uh, right now. Um, you know, there's so many, uh, you know, women's hockey players that are unbelievably talented and skilled. And uh, I'd love to hear your opinion on that because I think a lot of those women uh, deserve a little more credibility than they uh, deserve. Yeah, no, they, the, the women are, are so passionate and they have such a hard work ethic and amazing work ethic. And uh, for me, I got a chance to see that at a young age. And then again, in, in you know, my pro career, um, I skated with Don Kern. He coached a women's team as well. The, the girls team, I should say, uh, in my hometown, I guess used to skate every Tuesday and Thursday with those girls. He went, he took them to a national championship. So I saw them, how the girls, uh, prepared, how they practiced, how they saw the game. And it was different than the boys. It was hundred percent. There's no doubt about it. The boys were, yeah, there, it's just, there's men and females. They're totally different in some aspects, but uh, then again, when I played pro, I used to go to train in London, Ontario with uh, Kari Schneider and her husband. And we trained with uh, David Bull and I trained with Rebecca Johnson and, and Bailey Brown and watching those girls, how they busted their ass and what they were working towards and their dedication really gave me another in, little insight and reminder of the women. 
and um, you know, with another company that I was working with and, and involved with the sponsorship of the NWHL also gave me some more insight to, to women's hockey and, and how I, for me, I started the lane of uh, a business with online coaching and I immediately thought of the women because I thought yeah, having these girls and, and knowing their passion and their dedication and their work ethic and their knowledge and, and to your point, their skill and ability, how, how can we circle that back in a game into their game? Um, I thought it was super important and it was also a way to open a lane for them to, to kind of make a living out of this. And rightfully so they are experts at this game as well. And I think it needs, uh, I want to help highlight that and bring them to, you know, kind of bring them opportunity. Absolutely. That's awesome, man. Um, well, let's, uh, you know, um, let's talk about your career overseas, my man. Uh, you know, it's no secret that you had a lot of success over there. And um, I'd like to hear about uh, your new home over in Latvia, where you're, where you're, where you're staying now with your wife and your kid. Um, you know, elaborate maybe a little on uh, family values and, yeah, just what it's like over there. Yeah, Europe's a totally different game, you know, totally different world, really. Uh, obviously, it's, it's a, you know, big hurdles, obviously, language barrier. And now, I've, you know, when they used to come, Europeans used to come over to our side is, you, you know, I kind of feel for them. I'm in their shoes. You know, they come in the locker room. It's English only. And sometimes in London, we had a couple of Russians, you know, the Swedes come over or whatever it might be. And uh, now I get to experience that barrier, but uh, Europe's it's great. It's got its own, you know, culture is so different. It's, it's love it over there. Yeah. I think it's just much slower and much more calculated in the sense uh, of, you know, letting things marinate, letting things go through the process. It's not a f- rush, you know, things are kind of, taken slowly here and uh, built out with time. So that's something I've, I've learned about the culture here and, and kind of enjoy it. And I, I could use, uh, it helps me a lot because I'm fast, go, go, go. And sometimes I need that, you know, break, so to speak, and, and realize that things can get done. They don't have to go hundred miles an hour to get done. hundred percent. And it's kind of cool. You get it, you know, you go over there and you learn a lot about the culture and, you know, it's obviously, you know, I think we're all descendants obviously from Europe and, uh, you know, just the architecture and the beautitude over there. It's, uh, you know, I've traveled extensively all through Europe and um, it's, uh, it's, it's a different, uh, it's a different dealio over there than it is over here in North America. Uh, I don't think any of us have completely got everything figured out in life, but uh, you know, there's been a lot more going on over there since uh, the beginning of time, so to speak, in North America. So you must be feeling pretty good being over there. Yeah, it's been, it's great here. You know, I, I really do enjoy, I do enjoy it. It's much different uh a whole different scene and in this time of the world where we're in right now it's actually Latvia is one of the safest places to be with the with the COVID yeah. stuff so it's it is a, by numbers you know the cases are way down and uh my, my wife's happy so you know the expression is is very true happy wife happy life um <laughs> she's much more supportive with her family here our daughter's going to school so it's good to to get those roots going you know we haven't really had them yeah. I haven't had roots since I was, you know, 15 years old and moved away from home. So it's uh, f- now 34, starting to get them. Um, probably not exactly. Again, nothing goes as planned. I never, I never would have whipped up the scenario where uh, being grown my roots into to Europe, not playing hockey. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that things always change, and it's about being flexible. But I, I really do uh, start to enjoy the culture it's no matter of learning the language and then i can really because really on a day-to-day i i don't know what people are talking about i don't have a clue like a, not a just not a clue <laughs> try, try try learning three new words a day and then within a year you'll know the whole language yeah no i like it <laughs> and then you can teach small goals yeah. awesome man um yeah um if you don't mind uh, let's talk mental health uh you know we've talked personally about this topic and uh how has it affected your family? Yeah, you know, I had my, I've had my struggles and had my, you know, my stuff to deal with. So, uh, mental health has been been a battle in our, in my family. Uh, so it's something learning how to deal with and learning how to manage, so to speak, and live with has was a bit of a tough time. But uh, I feel taking steps towards living a better life and being happier with with life and understanding the bad days, not putting too much pressure on them. Um, is something where I've grown a lot as a person and, you know, not 
have when I have those bad days, not chasing them with dumb decisions and doing stupid shit to make it worse. Um, you know, understanding it, you know, a bad day can happen. You can have a bad day. It's okay. Like tomorrow's a new day. Yeah, man. Uh, it's well, I th- yeah, it's important. I think, uh, you know, the stigma is being lifted, you know, it's, you know, with people like uh, yourself and, uh, you know, many other people, uh, a lot of the people in the athletic world, um, you know, they're being very outspoken, uh, outspoken about their own personal uh, adventures uh, through the mental health journey. Um, you know, in these times are, uh, you know, they're not the easiest times of all, but, uh, you know, using, using the creative faculties of our imagination, uh, you know, anything is possible, really, you know, it's, I believe that. And uh, sometimes you just got to push through it. And even the, the smallest things of just getting up and taking a shower, you know, just those little things add up to, you know, uh, building resilience and mental strength. Yeah, for sure. Small victories, not setting the, you set these, the bar too high and you're going to set yourself up for failure. So Totally. Whatever it is that in you know, small victories are all the matter. I, not all the matter, but I think it's a really important step by step and whatever that is. And then if it's for, you know, the other thing is when you talk about stigma. So if, if, if your bar or your victory is getting up, taking a shower, me as another human being, she make well, that, that, uh, what's the word? No judgment towards that. Then I'm happy for you. If that's what, you know what I mean? That's, I think that's important too. understanding, you know, being supportive, for people who are struggling with mental health. Again, if it's getting up for a person, taking a shower, then as another human being, being supportive to that. And then say you got to cheer them on, but you know, be supportive of people's steps and getting, and getting, uh, building momentum. You understand what I'm trying to say? A hundred percent. Yeah. I think a lot of it is, uh, you know, what society has bestowed upon us, you know, uh, all these labels and misdiagnoses and whatnot. Uh, I know I was misdiagnosed with bipolar and, uh, later I found out it was complex, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, you know, which led to anxiety, which led to, you know, substance abuse and whatnot. And, um, you know, uh, getting over that was, uh, you know, there's a bit of a challenge that, you know, the substance abuse with just kind of came with the territory, you know, leaving home at a young age and uh, just trying to fit in, just wanted to be loved. Um, you know, and then as you get older, you look back and like, holy shit. And, uh, you know, what a journey, but, you know, I think it's our responsibility, um, to, you know, educate people that, uh, it's okay not to be okay. Yeah, it'll pass because you are okay you actually are, you are you are okay and it will pass and uh as much as it hurts sometimes uh you know having a good solid support network is of utmost paramount yeah no definitely but people that are understanding yeah. and uh, uh supportive just really I, support I, and i appreciate you being open about that too you know there's not a lot of people can actually uh, talk about it openly and uh, that's much appreciated to not just me, but the listeners, obviously, as well. So, um, yeah, what advice do you have for uh, all the young guns coming up uh, through the ranks? You know, there's nothing like hockey IQ. And uh, that's something that you're known for big time. Uh, yeah, I think studying your game is really important. So I think it always has been, in my opinion, but it's becoming more prominent now, especially with how fast technology is. You see the guys on the bench using uh, iPads and, and, uh, that kind of thing going over stuff. Um, I think it's really important to study your game and practice with a purpose, studying your film, studying your game and really a lot of imagery work. I think it's really important what helped me be successful, imagining these scenarios before they happen, studying the situations, uh, being prepared because it comes now, now it can come quicker than it used to. Um, yeah. The game's so much different now. It's it's you know it used to be by your time and you can hopefully get in there by 24, 25. I mean now the reality is, is you can pop in there at nineteen twenty. Um, so when you're young, younger, I guess you could say like teenage boy, fifteen, sixteen, starting to get these good routines and good habits of studying and preparing and visuals, you know, visual visualizing your success and imagery work. When you get in those scenarios, you're ready. You're prepared, and I think that's that's a big part of it. Now, what is preparation? Now, preparation's changed. It used to be just go squat the freaking gym and bench press the bar and be you know ripped and big jack guy for training camp. I think now it's it's more about studying the game because it's not so much of that really big tough physical game. It's more skilled. It's faster. 
it's more calculated and it's uh, it's happening very fast so you have to be able to process yeah. very fast and if you don't understand the information then you can't it takes you time to process so studying um these scenarios and studying what you want to uh, you can watch with, with the resources now. You can see the people that have already done it before you and, and use that for your information to study those scenarios. So when you get into it, yeah. you understand it well. It doesn't take you seven, eight, nine, ten tries. Sometimes when you get to that top level, you don't get seven, eight, nine, ten tries. You you don't. I mean, it's really that it comes down to it. You get into training camp or you get in a preseason game. You got to be ready to execute or someone else that's on the bubble that you're fighting with does execute and you're out. <laughs> you're going down to the minors or – not to put that much pressure on it, but that's, that's how kind of, that's how close everybody is. Once you get to the top, once you get to that bottleneck, everybody's pretty close to each other. So what you do differently than the next guy is really what keeps you there or gives you that opportunity. For sure. The power of focused thought, right? You know, it's um, what you think about, you bring about what you focus on expands and it seems like you've done a pretty good job at that. So um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I want our listeners uh, to actually really know about uh, your your baby, uh, Vision Forty Four, and who's involved. And uh, I know you've been working your ass off at this, and uh, this is your passion now, uh, being able to give back to that, uh, you know, to the game that you love. Um, yeah, tell me a little bit about that. I know one of my good buddies, Glenn, is uh, Glenn Metropolit. He'll end up being on the show eventually as well. We had a good talk yesterday. Um, wonderful guy. Um, so who's involved with all this and yeah, just uh, give uh, our listeners a bit of uh, perspective on uh, what's going on with that. Cause I, I think that's going to have a huge impact on the hockey world. Oh, thanks. Yeah, no, I, I'm really excited about it. It's so her platform is 44 vision hockey. We got 35, 36 coaches roughly now, and they all, uh, have played at extremely high levels of the game. Uh, we have six, um, six Olympic team member, women, women coaches. We have four NWHL uh, women's coaches and uh, seven ex-NHL guys. And the rest of the resume players are all played in the HL, high-level European. Um, the girls, we have some uh, Division I uh, players now coaching. So the idea is to take this knowledge and experience and, and circulate it back in the game. Like, like I mentioned, when I saw the girls at the gym, I saw their passion, dedication. I wanted to find a way to help not only them personally, Rebecca Johnson is on our platform as a coach, but also the women's game. And what I saw yeah. was a pain point in some regard of like opportunities for women to get, stay in the game, give back to the game. And, but it's gotta be financially beneficial for them you know not everything can Absolutely. be just donating your time and that stuff like that only goes so far when you're you know let's say you're a 25 26 27 year old woman you can't donate your time there needs yeah. to be a you know a financial uh opportunity there and a lot of what i saw from my view was these women high level women would circle back to you like where they went to college and stay on campus there which is great but the problem is that, that stays on that campus because there's all these rules of ncaa you can't recruit you can't talk to or this kind of thing right what i want to do is take these women these high level women and experts in the game and start taking that resource and circle it into the game all over the world so wherever they yeah, wherever yeah. girls have film we can get that resource of a rebecca johnson amanda palkey uh blake bolden um go down the list Jordan Brickner from the NWHL and you start getting these players working with the youth and circling that knowledge back in and then also making money doing it I think it's it's really covers a lot of checks a lot of boxes off right it's great for the game it's great for the growth of the game um girls young girls really enjoy having those kind of women mentor them and work on their game it's exciting I know for me thinking about it if I was 13, 14, 15 years old. And I had, uh, let's just sort of name out there. Like Mark Messier was going to cut up my film. Yeah. It would have, it would have made me so excited. You know, it got, I remember the last time I saw Mark Messier was, in, uh, he was uh, playing in Vancouver there. He signed that three-year contract and he blew his knee out. I was at the Roxy, uh, in a having a pee in a urinal right beside him and uh yeah we had, uh, we ended up having quite the night that night oh that's funny <laughs> yeah but uh yeah great leader as well um yeah, uh, yeah just curious like um you know I've, I've watched a lot of your highlight reels and they're unbelievable uh was there any uh player in specific that you actually pattern your game uh off of 
Uh, not really. I like to watch and st- I, I picked apart certain players or, or watch certain players and di- different players all around, you know, Sackick for shooting Forsberg for how he handled the puck and kind of used his body for puck protection and you know, a lot of reverse yeah. hits, stuff like that. Um, Lindstrom, I played on the power play. So watching Lindstrom, how he walked the line and what he looked for and what, how he, you know, manipulated the play from the blue line. I use that for information. Um, I, I like to just pick and when I would see a play or a player doing some things that I, I really liked, I would just try to watch it as much as I could and then go and back then we didn't have a tablet or an iPhone to carry around and rerun the video is literally watch it, remember it, and then go practice it. And then when I got a chance to watch it again, I'd see how like, how I was getting, it was like kind of getting close to what I saw, you know what I mean? And using imagery. Yeah, I do. So that's, I think imagery work is so important in, in imagining it and perfecting it and then comparing it, so to speak. Uh, like, I think it's huge. And uh, well, I mean, we're, we're actually, you know, we're visual and, you know, uh, you know, that's how we learn. We lo- learn through vision. We learn through feelings. We learn through em- our emotions. And, uh, so, yeah, I think you're really like, this is going to be big, man. I mean, who's, who are some of the players that are involved? I think, uh, Patrick Kane was one, uh, yeah, I just did some work with maybe Patrick Kane or I sent him some clips and he was really impressed with the work and the stuff that I pulled apart for him. And, um, just the tips I had for him, pick Corey Perry and Drew Doughty, uh, Drew Doughty did some clips for these guys. Yeah. And this was in the time of, uh, my, my infancy stages and getting it, seeing what, I, you know, proven concept, so to speak. So I did some, some clips for some high end people and they were really, the feedback was very positive, which gave me the, you know, that gave me a lot of uh, hope and a lot of, you know, positive energy towards, okay, we can go forward with this because you don't just start building. It's good to have dreams, (laughs) but at this age, it's a little bit different when you're 12, 13, you have dreams and you're shooting at them. You got a long time to, to miss your shot. When you're older, you start doing business, money's involved and you want to make yeah. sure your dream is not a pipe dream. So um, having these high, high end people really look at the stuff I was doing and have great opinions on it. Um, it gave me a lot of, uh, you know, it gave me a lot of positive energy and uh, yeah. proof of concept and all that stuff. And I started working with some other pro guys and the feedback's been really positive. So, uh, it's, it's not, uh, I like to say it and I say it on the platforms, this isn't theory, you know, it's experience and knowledge that we're passing along. And these, these are from people that have stood in those positions. So it's, it's not a fan in the, in the stands when they, why doesn't he shoot on the power play? Like we're, we're literally talking about where you and when and why you shoot on the power play and helping the players understand that. So it's, it's from a, a different perspective. Well, it says a lot about your character, obviously, you know, to get some of these high end players, they obviously respect you. And, uh, yeah, the ever so humble Rob Shrimp. I mean, uh, you know, to have that many players at the, you know, that have gone to the next level and had so much success and, you know, um, you reaching out to them and having them out on your platform. I mean, it's, that's just awesome. I mean, that's, uh, that's an accomplishment in its own right, right there. Yeah, no, I think I appreciate it. It's yeah. There's good people to, to, uh, in the game of hockey approved a lot and they, they've done a lot for the game and in the game, uh, to be, yeah, and the conversations with them and, and bouncing hockey talk off them and having them being able to grab pieces for me, it was, it was definitely gratifying. And, yeah, for sure, if I'd be honest, it made me feel really good about it. <laughs> it's, yeah. yeah. So, hey, so, so who, who's your favorite uh, roommate on the road and what was your go-to food on the road too? I know Wayne Gretzky used to eat, uh, rumor, rumor has it that Wayne Gretzky used to eat four hot dogs before every game. So what was Rob Schramm's go-to meal before a game? And who was his favorite roommate on the road? Maybe you can tell those a couple stories about that one. <laughs> oh, road roomies. That's that's a good question. Road roomies. We should do a whole segment on road roomies. Christ. I know. Wade Brookbank. Uh, Wade, Wade Brookbank was my roommate. Uh, <laughs> he was my roommate my rookie year in the minors. He used to call me Pigpen. <laughs> Pig pen. He'd get the room and I'd have my bag on like traveled in like 10 seconds. He'd be like, he's like we just got here man like look at it what did, he's like a tornado went off he's like you are a pig pen and then from the first time we remember he, he told me at the rest hey pig pen you ready for dinner <laughs> <laughs> 
That's good, man. I think that's, you know, what a lot of people don't understand is that, you know, behind the scenes, you know, behind the, the glitz and the glamour, you know, that uh, we're all just human beings and, you know, it's, uh, you know, being away from home and family, being on the road, what are the, uh, the you know, the, the NHL, the, the never home league, yeah. you know, it's, uh, you know, and, you know, obviously, uh, you know, it's a heavy schedule. Um, I know you never played the full 80 games, but, uh, you know, you played a lot of games and, you know, the AHL and other leagues as well. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, 80, 82 games is a, is a, is a long haul. And, and I mean, even what's going on now, um, I mean, do you ever think it's going to get back to normal where we see some fans in the stands again? Yeah, I, I don't, I think, uh, you know, this, uh, I'm not an expert by any means. None of us are really in this, what, what's going on, but, um, you know, see how it's reacting here. It's it's starting to, you know, there's there was actually some cases with the the team here, the professional team, uh, yeah, the KHL team. They had five guys come down with it. So yeah, I mean, it's it's a weird time, but I, yeah, it might be a year before before it's back to what we call normal, uh, yeah, whatever normal is, right? Whatever normal yeah, I know. Is. I, I, uh, has uh, had a quick chat with uh, I said it with uh, Glenn yesterday, and he lives in Tampa, and he said that Tampa's just going crazy right now. He said they're uh, it's just on fire, but uh, they took a big uh, hit last night. So, who, who, what's your prediction? Who, uh, Tampa or, or Dallas? And Dallas is stacked. They're doing they got a hell of a team. Yeah, you know what? I, I it's tough. It's tough to say, but I going for we go with the emotion and the friendship side of it. Obviously, Corey Perry uh, being in Dallas would pull for them. Um, who knows? It, it's be it's going to be a tough series, I think, because it, Tampa has had that heartbreak. They had that President Trophy season, and they lost first round to Columbus, so they've had that. Uh, we'll see how it goes, but Dallas they have. I mean, they are stacked with experience. Yeah, you know, huge depth on that team. Depth, Pavelski, you got Perry, um, you got the young studs with a good mixture. You got Radulov, who's you know he's he's a well, uh, what do you call it, uh, experienced vet. I mean, Radulov's been yeah. sneaky for a while, and he also had sick. some great experience in playoffs in the KHL. So I mean, he left for a little while, but he went over to the KHL and, and it did really well. So he's he's got and you got you you guys played against each other both in the NHL and the KHL, correct? I never played against no Radulov was in the show. He was over, you know, he, well, yeah, I did play against him. I think he was in uh, Moscow. Yeah. But he was in Moscow when I was here. It was lockout season when I was here. So yeah, he's, he was, uh, he's got a little bit, he's got a little bit of skill. Yeah, I know. And he's a big boy. Too. He's bigger <laughs> than you think. What is he about? 220? Yeah. He's a big dude. He's like six, two, six, yeah. three. He's kind of deceiving how big he is actually. He looks kind of tall and skinny on the ice, but he's a big dude and he's very skilled. He's a, yeah, a big dangler. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you know, one more question, then we'll wrap it up here. So um, if you have any message to the people of the world in these times, what would it be? Um, I guess I would attempt there's an emotion or uh, if there's something I would attach my – my trailer to my hitch, my wagon to, so to speak, it'd be positivity and creativity. Um, and these yeah. trying times, I think it's easy to get latched onto negativity and, and doom and gloom. Um, I think, you know, it's very tough what's going on in the world. I, I do understand. I don't come from a silver spoon. My family's you know, hard work and factory working dad. My mom works two yeah. jobs, but I understand and both sides. I got a chance to be a professional athlete. I got it. I got it all the way through, but, in these times, you know, some of these scenarios you think about, you know, the people losing their job is terrible. Some of these things could be a chance to start something new. If you can have That's the, a I chance think, yeah. to step back and be positive and creative, how many people lost their job that also like hated that freaking job? Um, you know, there's opportunity to, to be creative in this time. And, and that's maybe not for every single person. I, I think you can't attach positivity and creativity to everybody. You know, some people have circumstances where there isn't opportunity and that is tough. And we'll, hopefully they can find a way. But if you start with positivity, I think that's, that's your first step. Um, Absolutely. In any case, and try to figure yeah, I that think out. It's I think a lot of it's, uh, you know, reframing how uh, we're looking at the world too and what we've done to each other. You know, it's, uh, 
you know, uh, driven on economics and commodities and products and all this kind of stuff. I think it's, uh, you know, this is a chance where people are really showing their true colors. You know, uh, it's, uh, you know, a lot of people are pressing the panic button, which is uh, obviously, um, you know, when, you're, when your uh, career, your life uh, gets put on hold for uh, who knows how long, you know, that obviously drives uh, fear into the masses and uh, that vibration can be felt, you know, all the way across uh, the universe, so to speak, you know, I don't mean to get all spiritual on your ass, but um, you know, you're over there and you're saying that things are uh, not so bad. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the Okanagan right now and uh, you know, long lineups and uh, uh, lots of masks for sale. I know Haynes just came out with their own brand. So uh, I don't know. Um, I think it just is what it is, but I think on the, on the other side of this, you know, even though, unfortunately we are losing a lot of people to addiction and uh, mental health issues through this, not just the actual virus, which I'm not fully convinced that uh, it's nothing more than a flu or some sort of virus that, uh, you know, there's, a, there's all kinds of conspiracy theories that I'm not going to get into. And I don't think that's the point of this conversation, but um, yeah, I think on the other side of it uh, could be uh a whole new world of uh, opportunities and uh, awesomeness. Yeah, I think this, this transition was coming for a long time. It just took a weird virus yeah. to come. But it, I mean, AI has been coming for a long time. We've been paying attention. Yeah. And, uh, tech is huge. And um, th there's there's opportunity and it's not to. And there's also opportunity, you know, Ryan, in, in, in the normal fields of, of I have buddies that own construction companies and plumbing companies and you know, they're saying they're having a tough time filling jobs. So there, yeah. there is, I mean, there, there is not a, sh there's places, you know, to pick up. If again, if you get creative and think outside the box yeah. and with a positive attitude and, you know, there's, there's some good paying jobs actually, you know, it's, and those are, those aren't uh, Harvard law degree um, now qual qualifications. Um, so there is, there's opportunity. I think uh, on both sides, whether you want to take it to a big, you know, tech, tech company or, remote hockey platform who would have thought you know for me i didn't this isn't what i drew up in my picture but it's it changed my my you know be flexible stay with positive attitude and we launched this company 44 vision hockey in the middle of the pandemic there was no hockey but i had a you know i saw the picture and i i, I really thought this could have an impact and i believed in it and those testimonies gave me a lot of positive energy towards it and we're here we are. That's what I love about you, Rob. I love about the, it's, you know, that power of belief, you know, you got to believe it in order to receive it. And, uh, you know, um, I try to live by that motto, even though it's not always uncomfortable, but, uh, you know, it is what it is. We're human beings. Sometimes you got to get busy being uncomfortable to feel comfortable with what you're doing, you know, and that goes back to the goal soul thing. You know, if your goal ain't big enough, then, uh, you better, uh, maybe reconfigurate what you're thinking about as far as goals and, you know, and, and feel good about it at the same time and keep pursuing it and just uh, have that never give up attitude. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Be flexible. Yeah. Be, be flexible. I'm going to have to go join a yoga class later this afternoon. <laughs> I'll let you know how that goes. So I'm going to do the downward dog and spandex. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You want to join me on that and hold me accountable? Yeah. I just, uh, if, send me the video. I'll break it down. Okay. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. It, it, it might be a double post repost on Instagram. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, what do you think of this whole social media web anyways? I know it's, you know, it's a great platform to meet good people. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's so much emphasis these days is put on followers and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I don't give a fuck how many followers you have or whatever. I think it's just about, you know, sending that positive message out to people and, um, you know, yeah, be, being uh, kind of, uh, you know, judged on, oh, well, this guy's got 200,000 followers. He must be a better guy or, you know, I'm a, I, I have to emulate this person because he's got this many you know followers or whatever. I mean, I think it's all about coming together and just uh, doesn't matter how many followers you got. It's about, you know, the message. And um, plus, I think a lot of those followers are fake, too. <laughs> I think I mean, people buy the followers. People can buy followers, so. Yeah. Uh, 
unfortunately that's the world you live in. I don't, I don't get caught up in that. I, I could honestly care less. And even, even with the platform uh, on that side of it, I, I'm not, I've not once thought about followers. Uh, it's more about giving genuine information and, and having a solid product and believing in product. I don't care if we have, I don't care what we have for number. I don't have a goal for numbers no. as far as followers because we're not in the in the business of creating content. We're in the create uh, business of passing on knowledge and experience. So it's a much different world. I'm not doing things for double taps. Um, doing no. things for gratification and also for you know helping players gain in that aspect. So that's our real uh, metric of of um, you know what how we're doing. Not hey we got twenty thousand followers on it. Whatever that, that, that doesn't even come into conversation. So um it's really about being genuine when you're put and yep. comfortable in your own lane i think i don't if that's that's a tough world to live in too when you start worrying about getting double taps and, and always uh that's a lot of pressure on yourself as a person to to be constantly doing things for other people to approve of it uh it's tough i mean you're gonna run out of stuff eventually <laughs> i don't know because what you can only take it so far you know this is it's just how it is. And that's why I don't want to get caught up in that game. That's what I've mentioned to the people on the platform. We're not in with us. We all have our resume. We all have our experience and our knowledge that literally lies with inside of us. We're not, we don't have to do anything. I mean, we don't have to create anything as far as things for attention or for double taps. It's literally lies with inside of us. And it's just about passing that on. So that's, it's a whole different ball game. And eventually what will happen is we, we might get X amount of followers. Cool they're all going to get value add yeah. by following because the stuff that's coming out is not for attention. It's for benefiting or. Absolutely. Out. And the right people always come your way anyways. You know, you put it out there and you got something good. The right people always fall into your life for a specific purpose. Yeah. I really believe that. So um, yeah, you just got to keep going with what you believe in. And uh, it's something that obviously you've been doing your whole life and had you know great success. And that's why I love talking to you, Rob. Um, yeah. So I just uh, want to thank you so much uh, for your time. And um, number one is uh, being the first guest on all over the map and uh, greatly appreciated my friend. No problem. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you having me on buddy and uh, we'll stay in touch. We talk a lot. So I look forward yeah. to getting this out and also uh, watching your success and helping build that and be support beam for you. So um, good luck with the rest bad, of the man. pods and uh, always here for you, buddy. Thanks, buddy. I'm always here for you, too, my man. Ciao, bud.